repeat, ate, drank, and slept basketball. He lived for it. It was his life. That's what he was born to do. He was more fun to watch than anybody I've ever seen in the game. Flopping around with his hair, socks hanging down over his shoes. Behind his back, through his legs, spinning, shooting from all different angles. He was just a show. Pistol felt an obligation. He never wanted the fans to feel like they were ever cheated. He wanted to make sure that he did his thing. element of genius in his personality with the basketball but then there was a side to him he had these big brown sad looking eyes he was at the top of the mountain he heard so much roar in the crowd but there was a lot of heartache and a lot of tragedy that he lived through I don't think Pete was ever at peace with Pete Maravich It wasn't easy being Pistol Pete. CBS Sports presents... Pistol Pete, the life and times of Pete Maravich. He came out of the Louisiana Bayou an unlikely legend with a skinny frame, tousled hair, and floppy socks. They called him Pistol Pete. He put his signature on everything he did. The thousands of points, the dazzling moves, none of them ever patented. Each one original. Never seen before, never seen again. Nothing Pete Maravich ever did was simple or serene or ordinary. Not in life. Not even on the court. The one place where he should have felt most comfortable. Most at ease. Flashy and electric, Pete turned basketball into theater. For better or worse, he was the consummate showman. Always in the spotlight. Always on center stage. Before the game would start, during the national anthem, he'd look up at the flag, and then he'd look over to the scoreboard, and it's showtime. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. We're so glad you could attend. Come inside, come inside. Come inside, the show's about to start. was revolutionary. What he did, no one had ever done before. Nobody had ever handled the ball like that. He did things with the ball that Bob Cousy and his dreams at night could not do. He was really an artist, a dancer, a person who played with music in his ears. You could not stop him. He could go from in line to in line with the basketball, in the heat of battle, quicker, faster, than anyone I'd ever seen. You can see his eyes light up from time to time because he knew he was going to mess you up on the way, you know. Uh, he was going to do something that just undress you. Whoa. He made the ball disappear. <laughs> One guy back, the guy was back and then Pete swiped at the ball like this to tip it over here and then hit over the ball. The defensive man went that way and he slapped it back this way. And the referee called traveling on him. He said, traveling? 
How do you know it was traveling? You have never seen anyone do that before. <laughs> around out there and the ball just seemed like uh, it was something that he had from the time he was in a cradle creating different ways in which to just display his love for the game and here was a guy who was a basketball genius come see the show coming up as his father charts his course for success, the legacy of Pete Maravich begins. Welcome back to Pistol Pete. It was not uncommon that we'd be at the YMCA by 8 o'clock in the morning. A lot of times I'd just sit against the wall saying, God, I've been here 10 hours. What am I doing here? Yeah, I play basketball and I can keep up with anybody. I couldn't even begin to keep up with him. Pete said, stay with me, let me shoot foul shots, and we can leave when I miss one. He said, fine. 178 foul shots later, we left. He may have missed it on purpose so I could leave. When he was in high school, he would get the center circle, probably 110 degrees in the gym, and just dribble. Not go outside the circle and just go between his legs, behind his back and everything. Go for 10 straight minutes. He'd be sopping wet. All hours of the day and night, in the coldest of days, I've seen him in the rain. He would be out bouncing the basketball. The ball bouncing on concrete. You can hear it for a mile. And uh, I used to get aggravated in the middle of the night, listening to that ball bounce off that concrete up there. I'd see Pete out there doing these things, and he'd make believe, and he talked himself. Two seconds to go, and we're behind by one. Ah, we won. Maravich scores. For the Maravich family, life in America began in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. In the 1930s, Aliquippa was a tough town of steel mills and hard men one of whom was Pete's father, Press. Like nearly all of his contemporaries, Press was destined to work in the mill, a dead-end existence from which there was little hope of escaping. We're coming out of the throes of the Depression. The hours were long, tedious. The pay was very minimal. These were all exposed steel-making units. Lit the sky at night, and you know when you're coming in from many directions, you say, well, we're near Aliquippa. Sulfur dioxide permeated the air. There was soot that used to collect when you walked on the porch, it would just crunch under your feet. You would change your shirt three and four times a day. You didn't know when your husband went to work if he was coming home that day, because the work was so hard. Press Maravich wanted more and wanted to do better. That's why he went to college. That's why he played basketball. That was his way out of the mill. Press Maravich was good enough at basketball to earn a scholarship to Davis and Elkins College, where he set many school scoring records and eventually went on to play professionally. After three seasons, weary of the travel and no longer the player he once was, Press went into coaching, first at his alma mater, Davis and Elkins, later at Aliquippa High, where he earned an iron tough reputation. Press would run us like crazy, up and down the steps, around the gymnasium. I mean, just by looking at him, he put that steely look on you, and you knew he meant business. He was a very good disciplinarian. Uh, he made you aware of what was important, and he demanded you to do it that way. That's all. He was a driver, and he was committed. That was evident in Pistol Pete. Well, I think Pistol was in diapers when Press wanted to bounce a ball in front of him, and I knew that he was on his way. When Pete Maravich was born on June 22, 1947, Press began the process of molding his son in his own image. Press had one goal in life, and that was to make Pete the best basketball player in the world. It was all he had to give. He didn't have money. He knew basketball, and that was the only thing he had to pass on to Pete. 
he would have Pete take that basketball and put it through his legs and around his back. Dribbled right-handed two minutes, left-handed two minutes, and behind his back two minutes. So he had a little checklist, and Pete followed it religiously. And he never stopped. He had him do it every day, time after time after time. His daddy was always challenging him and making him carry a basketball. He had to have a basketball in his hand his entire life. Press gave him a basketball, and Pistol used it as a pillow. <laughs> he slept on it. He was programmed to play. You never saw him without a basketball. He was always doing something, twirling it on his finger. He'd ride a bicycle and dribble the ball. He dribbled the ball everywhere he went. Press would drive the car, and Pete would get in the back seat. The one time around the block, he would be hanging out the right hand side with the glass down, dribbling the ball. The next time around, he moved to the left-hand side of the car and dribbled with his left hand. He was riding from the back of the school on his knees, dribbling a basketball out the window. When he got out of the car, it wasn't the fact he had done something special, but he was needling the guy in the car. I told you I could do it. I told you I could do it. He dribbled a basketball down the sidewalk. He took it to the movie with him. I've been in a movie when he dribbled in there. People swore at him, you know, that didn't bother him. With the left hand for about half the movie, changing seats on the other side of the aisle, and dribbling with his right hand. He would bounce it off of chairs, he would bounce it off of the arm. He would be bouncing it off of people's head until he irritated somebody. Then they would go get the management, out he would go. You'd see him something like that, you know. You know what his mind was on. I'd say, where's our mind? And he'd just grin and get his pencil and start his work again. He would work when he was in class, but when he was out, he got to where he wasn't turning in the work. He says, I don't have much time. I said, why not? Sometime I'm playing basketball at 6 o'clock in the morning and at 9 o'clock at night. He says, now, when do I have time to do my work? I said, well, talk to your father about it. So his father came up to talk, and he said, well, says, I'm wanting Pete to be a basketball player. This is not that important. Well, I says, we differ there. I think it is important. I says, he's going to want to go to college. Don't worry about that. I'll get him in college. Pete's going to do well in this basketball. Says, he'll probably make more money at that than you'll ever make teaching. He wanted to do what his father wanted him to do, and that speaks well of him. Coming up next, Pete begins his basketball career and becomes one of the best high school players in the country. There were five or six fellows in the neighborhood that were about the same age, and we'd play touch football. Sometimes we'd play tackle football. Little did we know that one of the guys we were playing with beat the bear bit. But it's funny we didn't think of that when we were we were kids. He was just Pete to us. In 1956, when Pete was nine, Press Maravich became the head coach at Clemson. Under his father's watchful eye, Pete continued his basketball education. He was always playing somebody better than him, somebody bigger than him, somebody stronger than he was. He was always scrimmaging with college kids, even when he was in seventh, eighth grade. Bones McKinney, who was the head coach at Wake Forest, had Cousy down there, and Cousy participated in the scrimmage. Press Maravich inserted Pete, and Pete threw a long bounce pass with some English on it that someone picked up for a layup, and Cousy grabbed the ball and put it under his arm and said, time out. Who in the hell is that kid? As a player at Clemson would be practicing, and on the weekend, he'd slide over there and take some guys over the side, and they'd be shooting for nickels. Kind of a little cocky kid. He'd run his mouth up on the court and deliver. I'm going to whip you tomorrow, pulling their pants or doing something. He was just aggravating. He just loved to have fun. I remember playing a lot of horse with him. He didn't want to play horse with him. We would play horse. He invented more shots. And one of the shots that I could never do was spinning the ball off the elbow, spinning the ball off the head, go through his legs, around his back, spin the ball and off the knee. Spin it off his finger, bump it off his head, around the back at midcourt, close his eyes and score. 
He could make three out of five consistently from half court by throwing the ball up in the air and bounce around the foul line and bank in. By the time he had reached junior high, Pete had mastered the game well enough to play varsity basketball at Daniel High School. It was an amazing accomplishment considering his size. He was 11 or 12, absolutely scrawny, just tiny, no meat on his bones. I mean, you wondered how he could even run because he had no muscles, seemingly. We're standing out in the hall talking to the high school football coach, and he said he had a Charlie horse. The coach told him, says, Pete, that's impossible. You can't get a Charlie horse on bone. He was so small that the other teams wouldn't put anybody on him to guard him. I mean, it was a joke putting this little squirt out there on the court. And yet he'd go down the court and he'd shoot off of his hip. Pete was not strong enough to shoot a jump shot. He shot like he was drawing a holster. But Pete could score. To give Pete a 28 footer uh, was to give him something he could do seven out of ten times. And you would think, well, I could block that. So you go out to block it, he went around you. But the high hopes for Pete's basketball were almost derailed by his low self-esteem. He wouldn't ever come to practice on time. It drove the coach nuts. He finally realized that the older kids were giving him a hard time because he was immature physically and they'd make fun of him. So he never undressed in front of the team. Gosh, when you're in the eighth grade, you're 12 or 13. And these guys were 17 or 18. Well, he was a kid to them, a child. I'm sure he was terrified, but he never showed it. And the coach said, scoring this many points, who cares <laughs> if he's five minutes late? Like Pete, Press had success too, and that meant moving the family again, this time to Raleigh, North Carolina, where he took over for the legendary Everett Case and led NC State to the ACC championship. But having a new address wasn't the only change in Pete's life. I went to a Clemson football game after they had moved to Raleigh. This guy walked up to me, towered over me. I'm six feet, and he towered over me, walked up to me, and says, Hey, Coach Bagwell. And I kept scratching, my, Who is this guy? Coach, you don't remember who I am? He said, I'm Pete. I couldn't believe it. He'd gone about five or six inches, just boom, just like that. Pistol Pete grew to be like 6'6", six, six, with arms that made him 6'7", six, 6'8", six, but his size enhanced his skills immensely. By his junior year, Pete had moved on to Raleigh's Broughton High, where he elevated his game and electrified the crowd. He averaged 33 points, went over 47 points four different times. At that time, he wanted to be the best basketball player in the world, and he did everything he could do to achieve that goal. He could play in the ACC or anywhere in the country as a senior in high school. Pete's exceptional talent made it especially hard for the North Carolina State coach to evaluate incoming players. We would bring recruits in, and he would call me every week. We got any recruits coming in? I said, yeah, we got two coming in Friday. So that meant Saturday morning we're going to play. And Pete and I would play him two on two. We'd play about five games and mix it up, and one of them would always be guarding Pete. I remember going back to his dad. We beat him 21 to 5, you know, he's this. And we turned him down, didn't offer a scholarship. This guy goes on and makes all Big Ten. Basketball was his whole life. He didn't have a great deal of a social life. I really think he only had like one date in high school. And that was a senior prom, and I think he took the young lady home early. He would watch the pro game of the week every Sunday when he was in high school in the prep school. Then he would come and actually seek out players. He'd come to your apartment. Uh, out in the married housing there at NC State and wanted to play. I coached basketball 32 years. I've never been around any human being that take the game as seriously and have a passion for it like Pistol Pete Maravich. When he was in high school, he would come to my camp in the summer. I thought he would wear himself out because he'd do all those ball handling drills. And I said, Pete, you're going to burn yourself out, man. <laughs> By the time the season gets here, you're going to be so tired you won't be able to play. He said, Coach, I'm going to be a millionaire. That's my goal. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be the first guy that ever signs for a million dollars. Up next, Pete moves on to college at LSU, and Showtime takes on a life of its own. In 1966, Press Maravich was on the move again, leaving NC State for Louisiana State University. Although Pete could have played at any college, 
Press made it clear to his son that his choices were limited. I make my living coaching college basketball. He said, I'm living downstairs from the finest high school recruit in the country. Why shouldn't I recruit him and use every tactic I can to get him? He said, sign this. And I said, what is that? He said, that's a scholarship to LSU. I didn't know LSU even existed basketball-wise, and it really didn't at that point. But he said, sign this. And I said, you got to be crazy, Dad. He says, if you don't sign this contract, don't ever come home again. Press would ultimately get his way, but he would have to pay a bit of ransom. I was sitting in the living room talking to his dad about his move to LSU, and the phone rang, and Coach Maravich actually answered it. He said, Pete, it's for you. This call is from West Virginia. The coach was Bucky Waters. He was recruiting him to go to West Virginia, and all these coaches were saying, if you don't go with your dad, we would love to have you. And he finished that conversation that day, and he walked through, and Coach knew who he had been talking to, and he said, what did Bucky have to say? Pete said, oh, we had a good talk. He said, it sounds good up there. And he said, good my rear end. He said, you ain't going to West Virginia. Pete turned around and said, Dad, I told you, I ain't going to LSU unless I get a car. <laughs> and uh, fast forward six months, and out of the clear blue, he said, finances are killed, man. I'm broke again. I said, broke? He said, I got a house payment. I got two car payments. I said, two car payments? He said, yeah. And I said, what's the other one? He said, I got Pete a car. <laughs> so <laughs> Pete got the car. He said, you're going to see the greatest basketball play of all time. This was a father talking about his son. I couldn't believe it. I was recruited by his father. And when you're in high school, you know, and somebody's recruiting you, you always think they're going to tell you how great you are. But I never forget a press marriage telling me the biggest privilege I would have would be to play with his son, Petey. The first time I saw him was on campus, walking around the quadrangle. It wasn't hard to spot who Pete Maravich was. Floppy hair, tall, skinny, 6'5 kid. Back then, freshman didn't play on the varsity. His average in his freshman year was in the 40s. The buzz around town was, you better get there early. Because you may not get a seat. They would be lined up for an hour and a half or two hours before the game his freshman year. It changed the eating habits of people in Baton Rouge because the varsity started at 7.45 and freshmen tipped off at 5.45. So what you had to do to see the freshman game was skip supper. They'd be there at 5.15, packed house, over 11,000 people. And after the freshman game, the place would empty out and the varsity might have played before eight or 900 people. That's exactly right. I was on the varsity, and as we were warming up, people would be filing out. So you knew something special was going on. A year later, Pete moved up to the varsity, and LSU basketball was never the same. They would turn the lights out of LSU, come on the floor, he came out spit on the basketball, and it was showtime. atmosphere, Mardi Gras, Pistol Pete Maravich. The worst feeling I've ever had in my life, other than a letter from a divorce lawyer, was going down to Baton Rouge on Saturday night, going into that crazy cow palace they had with 10,000 half-drunk Cajuns, and knowing you had to hold their hero at under 50 points, it was just a bad feeling, believe me. Some of his shots were experimental. You never saw these things in practice. He'd just all of a sudden just come up with something. Side of a boy, they all said. You're at the top of the key and you get by your man and you have the big center right there. And instead of shooting it, he throws it up against the backboard. The immediate reaction of the rest of the players is to turn and look. He catches it off the backboard and as they come back, he slips right by and puts it right in for a layup. As he turns to dribble down court, there's a defender right there in a defensive stance. This close, and he turned and he put that ball through that defender's legs, circled him, and kept dribbling. The defenders just... I don't think he ever shot on balance in his life. He was always falling one way or another. He would shoot leaning shots. When he got hot, you could forget it. You were not going to stop it. Well, he's just an excitable boy. I had a 
had an opportunity to guard Peter. We held him to 17 points in the first half in that ball game. We were really proud of that. Unfortunately, he got 41 in the second half. We were playing two lane down there, and their coach kept yelling, make them go left, make them go left, you can't go left. They held him about 60 points that night, so obviously you could go left. And you got to remember, that was with no three-point line. The numbers he would have rung up would have been frightening. Conservatively, you'd have to give him 10, 12 points a game more, which gets him up into 55, 56 points a game, which is absurd. He was the best passer and ball handler I have ever seen. He made some phenomenal passes. Behind his back. Around his head. Between his legs. Passes. He'd drive people crazy with the way he could pass the ball, and especially his teammates. His teammates had marks all over their bodies where the basketball hit them when they never knew it was coming. I always used to joke, the only time that you really have to watch Pete is when he wasn't looking at you. If he was looking right at you, you're not going to get the ball, but as soon as he turns, you may get it. The more he got the crowd revved up, the more sensational his passing and his ball handling became. At LSU, Pete was the show the sole support of an average team. He outclassed the competition, although there were times when the competition in the all-white Southeastern Conference wasn't all that challenging. So, Maravich did whatever he pleased. And more often than not, what he did defied description. Pete was not shy. With Press's blessing, he took an amazing amount of shots. In his first varsity game, Pistol fired up 50, and only once in his sophomore year did he take less than 20. But in being as much of a showman as he was a player, Pete Maravich brought the LSU basketball program out of the dark ages and into the national spotlight. Coming up, Pete takes showtime to a higher level and becomes college basketball's all-time leading scorer. Before Pete, the South only rose for football. But that was before Maravich made basketball fashionable, before they began calling LSU Maravich University. Pete would fill arenas all over the SEC, arenas that'd be half empty. For the first time, there was a figure who filled basketball arenas from one end of the South to the other. Pete's name was dynamite. I'll never will forget the Alabama game in 1970. That's Bear Bryant country. That's football country. And as we flew over Tuscaloosa, they had about four lines, about four to 500 yards long, waiting to get a ticket to see Pistol Pete play. Many places we went, the marquees at the hotels would say, welcome Pistol Pete in LSU. Everywhere we went on the road, they came to see the pistol. His gun was always loaded, and he was always firing. Without the spectators, uh, you don't have any athletics. And what I try to do is just give the spectators their $3 or $3.50 a ticket worth of enjoyment. He 
and I took a trip down to Daytona Beach for a week in the summertime. It's a basketball stand like you see at a county fair, and this guy's barking at the crowd out there. You know, step right up, come in, win yourself a teddy bear. So as we approach, you know, Pete says, we're going to have some fun. Pete walks up and he says, man, what you got to do here? And the guy says, you make two in a row, you get a large bear. He looks over at me and says, Bob, I believe I'm going to try this. I said, all right, give it a shot, man. He hits two in a row, bam, bam. So he gets a big bear, hands it to me, reaches in his pocket, gives the guy another dollar. I said, I'm going to try it one more time. The guy said, okay. Well, this time there must be 30, 40 people around. Two more in a row, bam, bam. Shoots two more, bam, bam. That's six in a row he's hitting that. He takes another bear down. The guy's got two big bears left. That's all he's got up there. The guy said, that's it. You're not shooting anymore. You're not shooting anymore. Well, then this is when Pete puts on the show. Pete backs out into the crowd. How about if I shoot from back here? And the guy looked at him like he was crazy. He backs out in the crowd. He throws the ball up in the air about four or five times, you know, like checking the wind and all that kind of stuff. Then he lets it go over top of the wooden structure. Bottom out of it. The crowd goes crazy. Throw the ball back to him the second time. This time, when he catches the ball, he starts spinning it on his finger. He's bouncing it off his knee. He's bouncing it off his other knee. He's bouncing it off his head. He's dribbling it between his legs and all this stuff. And the guy's got one teddy bear up there. And the guy says, You are not shooting again if you go in the ocean. He comes over, takes the bears, goes out in the crowd gives them to the kids, and we walk off, and it was like the Lone Ranger. And then somebody went and told the guy to understand that <laughs> he had just been had by Pistol Pete. <laughs> the media would just came out of the woodwork to see this guy and to talk and interview. Kids emulated him all over America. The socks. We picked the socks up in our equipment room at NC State. These socks were like hunting socks, actually. You wore regular basketball socks and put these over them, and they came up pretty high on you. But they were very comfortable and very easy to get on, and they helped prevent blisters. And I remember once I wore them, I loved them. I wore them all the time. They, we didn't wear them in games because uh, they looked bad. He was just superstitious. He had a pair of socks, and he wouldn't let go of those things. After a game, you take everything off, you throw it in the middle of the floor. The student managers would pick it all up, put it in the bags, and take it to the laundry room. He never threw those socks in there. He took them home himself. In his three varsity seasons, the boy with the floppy socks not only ruined reputations, he scored more than 50 points in a game 28 times, averaged more than 44 points a game, and broke every scoring record in LSU history. And he didn't stop there. By the time Pistol Pete was through shooting, he had sped past the great Oscar Robertson to become the most prolific scorer in college basketball history. I think I'm very fortunate to uh, break his record because uh, I followed him ever since I was a young boy and uh, I always felt he was the greatest. He was a performer and he knew he was. He was on stage. He lived for the role of the crowd. Some people have never heard it. He heard it every night. Up next, Pete takes his show to the pros, but difficult times await his arrival. There are many factors that we discussed at great length and in great depth. To try to get where we wanted to be, uh, getting the best possible deal we could for Pete. We are most happy to announce that Pete Maravich will play professional basketball for the Atlanta Hawks. They made us an offer we couldn't refuse, enough to make the Guinness World Book of Records back then. Pete's contract with the Atlanta Hawks proved Press Maravich a profit. Five years, $1.9 million. At nearly $400,000 a season, it was almost 10 times the league average. Not only that, as a white, flashy superstar, Madison Avenue came calling before Maravich even played one NBA game. Now keep your eye on Pete's hair as he demonstrates some not-so-slick hair control. 
And along comes this guy, Pete Maravich, and he's got this bushy mane of hair that's really reflective of the styles that were coming to be in America. Four seconds to go. The Hawks are down by one. Maravich brings his hair down court. His hair looks right. It fakes left. It breaks free. Amazing. Great control. Now his hair cuts cross court. All controlled by Maravich. When he handled a basketball, that hair just flowed. Yes. That's just got to be the best hair in the league. Maravich was a free spirit. Maravich was different. He had a quick smile, and it was natural, and he was a star being different. We negotiated a deal with Maravich that was a $100,000 deal, which was an exorbitant amount to pay an athlete. Do you see any adjustment problems with your teammates and other players in pro basketball due to the financial size of your contract? No, I don't think so, uh, really. My thing was to grow up and play the game of basketball and not worry about what everybody else thought. I'm just on this earth for 40 or 50, 60 years out of 5 billion, so that's the way I look at it. Pete might not have been concerned, but his Hawks teammates didn't see it that way. To them, Maravich hadn't yet earned his money or their respect. He was one of the few white players on the team. That was a problem. He was the rich white kid. Not just for Atlanta, but for the NBA, Pistol Pete was the great white oak. It's not so much what Pete did. It was the way management reacted to the players. They had rules for Pete, rules for the rest of the players, which becomes an irritant. They wouldn't pay Lenny Wilkins $60,000 to come to Atlanta. And then when Pete comes, all of a sudden, nothing's a problem. They talk about everybody's salary but Pete's salary, and then when they do talk about it, they lie about it. I'm not stupid. He was deeply troubled about what was going on with the team and what he could do to fix it. Sometimes he would bend over backwards to pick up a tab. Sometimes guys would resent that, you know, because they'd feel like he was trying to show off, throwing his money around. So then sometimes he wouldn't pick up a tab and somebody say, well, look, at this guy's got all this money and he's a cheap son of a gun. So there were the money issues and then there were the issues on the court with Pete's style of play. All he wanted to do was fly up and down the floor, throwing passes that those guys had never seen before, hitting them in the back of the head, throwing them out of bounds. I sort of had it with him when we were on the fast break, and he, for some reason, decides to roll the ball. So when he rolled the ball down the floor, I just let it roll out of bounds. Coach goes crazy. Why didn't you pick the ball up? I said, why did he roll it? I mean, the fans went crazy, but that's not basketball. Maybe he should be playing with the Globetrotters. This is the first season out from under Daddy's wing. Daddy had let him do anything he wanted to do. Daddy wasn't there, and now he was with the big boys. He wasn't the king anymore. It wasn't that he didn't have the game. It's that he didn't realize what the game was. He was a little bit overwhelmed by the pro game, which, of course, was startling to everybody, so he was criticized. Pete had never been criticized in his life. He was pampered. He was always a star. Why are you doing this to me? I said, because you stunk, Pete. I can't write in the paper tomorrow that you were great. I call him the peach tree pop gun one time instead of Pistol Pete, and that didn't go over very well. He was under pretty intense scrutiny when he came into the league. And it wasn't just in Atlanta. I mean, it was all over the country. In Philadelphia, they held up some sign that said, well, hot dogs only go for 10 cents in Philadelphia. How come you got $2 million? For the first time in his life, Pete was struggling on a basketball court. It wasn't that he was playing that poorly. By his third season in the league, Maravich was averaging more than 25 points a game, and by his fourth, he was an all-star. But the team was losing, and the pressure of living up to his reputation, to his image as Pistol Pete, was catching up to him. He would do a lot of things that a coach like myself I didn't like. That's what I would say, hey, Pistol, you got to hit the open man. You don't have to do everything. He felt the responsibilities on his shoulder. It's my job to see to it that we win this game. And I'll win it for us because I've done it many times in the past. He got kicked out of a game. And when we came in at halftime, he was sitting on the floor. He'd had a couple beers. So now we go out and play the second half. 
we get beat, come back in, and had a few more beers. He couldn't drink. He really couldn't. Give him a couple of beers, and you better get him off the wall. Because of that, I had to suspend him for not representing the Hawks in a proper manner. After the suspension, we had 33 games to play. I started him all 33 games, but we had no relationship. He's through with me. Either he's going or I'm going. In the offseason, Pete would be the one to go, ending his four turbulent seasons in Atlanta. When we come back, Pete makes a triumphant return to Louisiana, and tragedy strikes the Maravich family. Before the 1975 season, Pete was traded to the New Orleans Jazz, a first-year expansion team desperate to make some noise. He had the goatee and the purse, had a pistol on the side of him, smoke coming out of him. He was the whole thing. No one seemed to even pay attention to anybody else. He was back on stage. I really can't see any other place that compares with this town. He was the first rock star I ever hung around. He carried over to airports and hotel lobbies, and he was bigger than life, and I carried right on under the floor. Pistol Pete, you echo through the building. Here he is. <laughs> Here was Pete, back home in Louisiana, free to do what he pleased, running and gunning like the good old days. He should have been happy, but there was something wrong in the Crescent City. There wasn't a lot of peace in his life at that time. There was a lot of problems at home. There were real problems there. The most serious problem in Pete's life was the slipping emotional health of his mother, Helen. Sadly, it was not a new situation. For some time, Helen Maravich had led a troubled life, but now her erratic behavior was getting worse. Helen was pretty much of an introvert. She didn't socialize and didn't get out and do a lot of things with a lot of other people. She cooked and took care of her family, and that was about it. For much of her married life, it was clear that Helen's self-worth was tied up in the well-being of her family. But the pressure of being a basketball widow had finally grown too great to bear. Helen Maravich felt isolated from this capsule of basketball that was created around Press and Pete. The coaching, the planning, the recruiting. So in essence, Helen was home alone. And she got to be very, very lonely. She withdrew and had an alcohol problem that she actually hid from press. And the Pete was the one who said, look, she's hiding bottles of alcohol around here. And then her behavior became more and more bizarre. I was talking to Pete and his dad, and the mother came upon them as we were talking. The mother scolded her husband and her son. She said, you're ignoring me. You don't pay any attention to me. I'm here, I'm by myself, and you guys go your own way. How about spending some time with me once in a while? She would just keep saying, Joyce, I'm not the same person that you knew. And when we lived back in Clemson, I really didn't realize how badly she had gotten. On October the 10th, 1974, Helen Maravich took her own life. When Helen died, they had the funeral up in Aliquippa. Pete didn't say anything to anybody. He was there in body. God knows where he was elsewhere. His eyes got soft and subdued as opposed to big and intense. We couldn't find Pete after a game. And so about four or five of us split up, went back into town and went looking for him. And I found him in a bar and then took him back to the hotel. The effect on him was immense. As he struggled to cope with his mother's death, Pete found comfort on the court. Through the expansion chaos of the first five jazz seasons, Maravich made the all-star team three times, led the league in scoring, and transformed his game. We were very competitive, and it was because Peter was less of a star. He was no less better of a player. He was actually a better player, but he was less of a star. Learn how to play winning basketball, evolve a winning attitude, and yet also provide the thrill that the people wanted, which was always something fancy. It was a tightrope, but by that year, he had mastered it, and he was really a great pro. 
Pete goes out against the New York Knicks, one of the best teams in the NBA at the time, up against Walt Frazier, who was on the all-defensive team just about every year. I just remember Frazier really tired of it all because he was just raining down jumpers on him. So the pistol lets it fly. Of a charter flight back to New York. Here's a Maravich shot in the lane. And what a show he put on him. He scores 68 points. That was not a quiet 68. He was making sure that the guys out on the floor knew he was getting it. And Walt Frazier turned to Earl Monroe once, and Earl the Pearl said, no, man, you're the defensive genius. You stay with him. He was all NBA first team. He was considered, if not the premier guard, certainly one of the top three or four guards in the league, no doubt about it. But Pete's most productive period as a pro would come to an abrupt end. January 31st, 1978. We were ahead about 20 points in a game. Pete got the ball out on the fast break and looked up. And he rifled a behind the back, through the legs, half-court bounce pass. Crowd goes crazy and he hits his leg wrong, collapses in a heap. It was really never quite the same after that. Welcome back to Pistol Pete. I watched him, and he was in pain. He couldn't go onto the court and invent that next move, make the next trick work. No longer able to star in the role of Pistol Pete after his injury, Maravich struggled for his identity. What had been a recurring theme throughout his life had left Pete with deep emotional scars. He was a troubled guy. He's up and down all the time. One day, he's happy as could be. Next day, he wouldn't speak to anybody. I always worried about it because I really felt that he needed help because he was not a happy person. And I remember telling his father that, and he didn't like it. He didn't want to hear that. His admirers think he is the beau ideal of basketball, Pistol Pete the Paragon. His detractors think he is a shot-happy show-off, a pop gun protected by his father, the coach. Basketball entrepreneurs think he is a prepackaged legend who will draw like honey on an anthill. The half-finished dome has a frail, impractical look, but is firmly rooted in showmanship, as is the frail, impractical-looking basketball player whose feats inspired its building. This is Haywood Hale Brune in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. To those who knew him well, for much of his basketball life, Pete Maravich projected the brooding image of a tortured soul. He reminded me of a rat that I had seen as a child, and it just looked so frightened. He started a basketball game having to maintain a scoring average of 44.5 points. Pete just raced up and down that court. He had this demon look in his eyes, frantic, just to get off that next shot. I think of those floppy socks. You wonder if those socks were sagging because they didn't fit, as if he didn't have time to eat enough. Basketball owned him. He had a gift, and yet he was never satisfied. Go back and read about Mozart. His fifth symphony had to be better than his fourth. Harry Houdini had to do one better trick than the last one. John Kennedy had to make one better speech than his inauguration speech. Pete Maravich was the same way. In a career filled with wonder and wizardry, Team success was the one thing that was missing from Pete's resume. His frustration began at LSU, where his Tigers never made the NCAA tournament, even though Pete did everything asked of him. Press kind of made it a directive that Pete needed to shoot like 40 times a game or we couldn't win. Pete has to shoot. We had six games head to head. Pete averaged 52 points a game. But I think the closest that LSU ever came to beating us was nine points. Somebody came in and said, the Tigers lost by three. And the guy said, oh, really? So how many did Pete get? That's what they were interested in. How many did Pete get? He had finally just given up and said, OK, I'll just be what they want me to be. I think that's part of what he became. I think he really just kind of caved into what people expected him to be. And the older he got, it seemed like it became more of a burden to him. And any team that got Pete Maverick wanted Pete Maverick to show me, wanted to fill the seat. Pete went to teams that built themselves around him and his image. 
it just kept reinforcing all the things that he did not want to have and then kept reinforcing all the problems that he had. Part of his package was a couple of extra loops and bells and whistles. It was who he was, it was how he played, it was how he got the joy out of playing. But there were plenty of times, I'm sure, when he probably wishes he could have made the straight play and he felt obligated to kind of give the fans a show. It took a toll on him as an individual. It took a toll on him psychologically. I kind of felt sorry for Pete. Sometimes he wished he were just an average player. He would have been relieved at times to not have that kind of pressure on him. Here's a person who's been the star on every team that he's ever been on. You know, high school, collegiate player of the year. But he wanted a championship ring more than anything else. I'm not a greedy person. I don't care to have ten rings. I just want one. The fact that he didn't get that ring haunted him. He believed that if he won a championship, that would mitigate all the criticism he got of being a one-man player, being a hot dog. That would be the ultimate revenge, and he was never able to get that. He had a big void inside him, and he was always trying to fill that void. He would begin searching or other avenues to bring him some contentment. Everything he did, he was obsessed by. It was known that Pete drank. He basically became an alcoholic while in the NBA. He would start drinking in the locker room, in the bus, drink on the plane. He'd wake up at 11 o'clock the next morning and not even realize where he was. About two hours before game time, he would pump his adrenaline up to go out and put on the show and then do the whole thing over again the next day. Just going from thing to thing, and then he would be obsessed with that, and then move on when that didn't bring him a certain contentment. Very intense nutrition, fasting. Goat's milk. Vegetarianism. Be on an airplane with a full tomato, even like an apple. He'd be reading the labels on everything. He wouldn't eat this, wouldn't eat that. Transcendental meditation, karate. He'd be down at the karate gym at 8 o'clock in the morning till 9 at night, do drills, all day long. You might have somebody go and become a world karate champion. He went to a black belt in less than a year. He had some screwy ideas, you know, about UFOlogy, UFOs landing on his roof. He believed people existed in outer space. Sometimes he was off the wall. He was always searching for that happiness he had when he was a kid playing basketball. If I could go back to any time in my life, it'd be when I was a kid. Showtime, number 44. Towards the end of his career, Pete's quest for happiness took him to Boston. He wanted that championship, but for the first time in his life, he was more of a sideshow than the main act. He was like a punch drunk fighter, trying to turn back the clock, trying to still make it happen again and relive those great moments, but you can't do it. He knew it was time to get out. I remember getting a telephone call from him one morning, and you know, very quietly, matter of factly, he said, Les, I'm leaving pro basketball and it's a done deal. But Pete's timing was typically poor. The year he retired, the Celtics won the title. When Boston went on to win that championship without him, I mean, he was suicidal. I used to drive my Porsche 140 miles an hour across the Causeway Bridge. Things were running through my mind, like I just turned the wheel to the right 10 degrees. It looked like an accident. They'll say, what a tragedy. And then he would have no more pain. When we return, Pete leaves basketball and finds happiness as a father and a newfound faith in religion. It was almost like a heroin addict. I'd play for 30 years and all of a sudden I just cold turkey quit basketball. I came home and became a recluse for almost two years. Literally stayed in my house. All during that time I was trying to find answers in my life that I couldn't find. He was lying in bed one night, it was late, he hadn't been able to fall asleep, and all of a sudden he felt like electricity had hit him, and his fingers were shaking, and he called out in pain, and he said he heard God speak to him and say, come to me, and I'll help you. He believed that God spoke to him that day, and from that moment on, he was transformed and found a new purpose in life that did bring him incredible satisfaction an incredible piece. He was a changed man. 
I used to get asked the question all the time, what's it like being married to Pistol Pete? And the only thing I could tell them is, I don't know what it's like being married to Pistol Pete. I'm married to Pete Maravich, the person. After a lengthy courtship, Pete and Jackie Maravich finally got married in 1976. They soon had two sons who quickly became as important to Pete as he once was to his father. He was a very loving and giving person, a wonderful father. He loved his kids and devoted a lot of time to them, taking them to church, reading the Bible to them. Of course, they had a basketball in their hands when they were a year old. He was always working with them, shooting with them, showing them different things, but it didn't matter what they were as long as they had Christ in their life and they were happy doing what they wanted to do. so much happier and he wanted to share that with everybody you very seldom saw him without a bible in his hand he was a tremendous speaker he traveled all over the united states talking to fellowship of christian athletes young people he was going to prisons talking to you guys on death row every thanksgiving he would go to one of the neighborhoods and he would buy two, make two to three hundred turkeys and he would deliver them himself. He put them all in the trunk of his car. He had a camp that he spent a lot of time with and a lot of money on. They learned about nutrition. They learned about proper exercise. They learned about Christianity. And they learned about basketball. He became interested in the total human being, not just the skills of that human being. He just seemed more relaxed, and there wasn't that haunted look in his eyes. That had gone. And he smiled. He smiled. He wasn't a floppy-haired, floppy socks guy anymore. He was where you hope all people get to, to be comfortable with yourself. Nobody deserved it more than him. He was absolutely candid and honest about himself and about what he wanted in life and said, I could die tomorrow. I am now at peace with my God. Not a thousand NBA championships, not a thousand Hall of Fame rings, not a hundred billion dollars would I trade for my position where I am right now. But in the fall of 1986, Pete's faith was tested when his father was diagnosed with cancer. Press stubbornly refused traditional medical treatment, moved in to spend his last days with Pete, and like his son, became a born-again Christian. With their shared faith, the two Maravich men were finally able to make sense of their complex, lifelong relationship. The diverse elements which can create disharmony among fathers and sons have filled a number of indigestible books. In the case of Coach Press Maravich and his son Pete, the drumbeat dribble of a basketball creates a tempo to which they can march in step. There are, of course, times when any son listening to his father has the look of a turtle in shock. But for 16 years, the Maraviches have worked, sometimes abrasively, but always closely, on Pete's game. He was so much the instrument of his father's desire that there wasn't much to Pete himself. I think it emptied him of personality. I once visited his apartment, and it looked like a decorator's showroom. It was the most unpersonal kind of place, full of stainless steel furniture and non-objective paintings. It depressed me just to look around. I remember seeing him in 1970 after his senior year at LSU. He came to Cutcher's Country Club in upstate New York where they used to hold a basketball game every summer. Some little kid at the clinic was watching him. And he came up to Press Maravich afterward and he said, how long did it take Pete to learn how to do that? And Press said, all his life, it's a, oh, well, I don't have that much time. I played six to ten hours a day, and I was really a basketball android. That's the only thing I was committed to. I was totally dedicated and possessed by basketball. There was nothing else in my life. One time he came to practice during the Christmas holidays and had the side of his face. It was all black and blue. And he said, you know, Pete, what happened to you? And he said he walked in the house and had beer on his breath, and Press just popped him on the spot. And I don't know that it was as much because of drinking the beer as much as he wasn't being true to, quote, the game, the basketball. When I was a sophomore, he was diagramming a play on the floor. And I was looking at this play, and I just couldn't see it working. 
this isn't going to work. He jumped up and hit me across the head and said, look, I'm the coach. You're the player. You listen to me. So uh, in front of 11,000 people, I was sort of embarrassed at this. And uh, so I didn't say much. And we went out, and uh, it turned out to uh, win the ball game for us. So uh, ever since that time, I've uh, considered just, just been very exciting for me to play for him. And uh, I have no regrets. If I was going to criticize Coach Maravich for anything in the world, it would be for loving his son too much. And that's as good a criticism as you give somebody. They had some differences, but he loved his daddy from the bottom of his heart. He respected his father. Press was not only his father, Press was his coach. The guy that taught him how to bounce the ball between his legs and gave him all those impossible drills as a six-year-old. He loved Press. They had all these different conflicting relationships, and then Pete talked about how in the last year of Press's life, Pete would give him his shots, Pete would carry him to bed. Pete thought that was very much the way that Press used to carry him and take him to basketball camps or take him home after a game. Their roles just completely reversed, and through that, there was this incredible, intense relationship that left such a vivid image in Pete's mind. Pete delivered the eulogy, two hours, just talking about his father and himself and life after death and what this would mean. And he was spellbinding. My dad was my hero. I wouldn't be in the position I am today if it hadn't been for my father. He bent over and told his dad, he said, I'll see you soon. Pete knew that he would see his dad again. Up next, a life well lived and a legacy that will stay with us forever. He was an extraordinary interview subject. What you want in a good interview is someone who has passion and who can laugh at themselves a little. And Pete had that ability. I mean, he could, if you were describing a, a play, he could put you on the floor. But he was a true, true born again. He had it in his heart. He deeply believed, he willingly, openly discussed his earlier life. But I had great respect for Pete. I really liked him. We really got along. He had started complaining about how tired he was all the time. And that wasn't like him. I know he didn't look good. His coloring was changing. And he had lost weight. But he was the type that didn't like to go to doctors. I get a package. And I open a package, and it's a Bible. And I'm, I'm not the most religious person in the world, and my name is imprinted, a beautiful leather-embossed Bible. And I open a Bible, and there's a long, handwritten thing to me on the first page from Pete. You know, dear Larry, I hope this gives you inspiration, as it has for me. And as I'm reading this, they announce a sports bulletin. An American original died today, Pistol Pete Maravich. He was college basketball's all-time scoring champion and later a professional star. He died today during a pickup basketball game at a church in Pasadena, California. A heart attack is suspected. Died playing the game he loved. Mm -hmm. When they did an autopsy, to find out why he collapsed on his basketball court. They found out that he was missing his right coronary artery. Born with it that way. A defective heart. Basically half his heart wouldn't bump. I mean, it's almost stunning because here's a guy that ran his whole life. Unlike Secretariat, who when they opened up his heart, he had an enlarged heart. His heart was bigger. He basically had a bigger engine than the horses he was running against. Pete had a smaller heart, but stronger in some ways. He did not leave this earth not sure of himself and not satisfied with himself. He saw the light, and he was happy. He was at peace. From childhood, Pete Maravich dedicated his life to basketball, and the results were historic. His college scoring records, the ones he set with uncommon flair will likely stand forever.
equaled only by his professional career, in which he was chosen as one of the top 50 players in the history of the NBA. You can be the greatest on the face of the earth. That's something if you want to do that bad enough. They still talk about the wraparound behind the back pass. And something will happen to say, my God, he looks like Maravich. His legacy will live forever. He broke the molds. He didn't do it the way people had always been taught. He's like a guy who wins the Nobel Prize for some discovery he made 30 years ago. Well, Pete was that much of a revolutionary for the sport of basketball, but I don't think people realized it at the time. He added something to the NBA. That the NBA was lacking at a time when the game was not very popular. Life was shortened. He really had a full life. I mean, there's a legacy there. He crammed uh, 100 years of life in 40 years. And uh, when you look back and you examine uh, those 40 years, there's something there for everybody to benefit from. In association with CBS Sports, this has been an SFX Black Canyon production.